Justice, I love our panel discussions because it has so many different perspectives. And in the live stream today, uh, the panel is full of streaming experts. So we have people who have built streaming projects, uh, open source, uh, multiple people actually, uh, someone who's built streaming infrastructure at Stripe and Netflix, uh, and then several really cool uh, streaming tools, uh, the founders of these streaming tools, which is, which is super cool. Here's the burning question that I want to ask. Um, streaming is becoming increasingly popular and the technology around it has grown significantly, right? So if you think, you know, sort of beyond Kafka, right? Kafka is kind of a de facto, right? But there are so many new technologies that have emerged. And so what I want to ask these people is how we think about the difference between batch versus streaming. Um, is that even a helpful paradigm, you know, as we look out into the future, um, you know, of how data should flow through a system. So that's what I'm going to ask. How about you? Yeah, uh, actually, I want to ask, like, the, what the title of uh, this uh, panel is, what's the future uh, of streaming? Like, uh, the industry is, like, producing and has developed a uh, large number of, like, streaming platforms for the past, like, decades or so. So uh, what's next? Like what we need to build um, and what kind of use cases uh, we are addressing that we couldn't do efficiently like in the past or in the present. Because all of the, like these guys are like building some amazing new tools, uh, bringing some new paradigms in how to do like streaming processing. And um, I'd love to learn like the why and the how uh, and how this connects like with the previous generation of streaming processing platforms. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Well, I say we uh, we get going. Welcome to the Data Stack Show. Uh, I have been so excited about having this group of panelists because we had such fun conversations with all of you about uh, streaming. And today we get to talk about all sorts of stuff as it relates to streaming, the future of streaming, et cetera. So before we get going, uh, let's just do some quick intros uh, for those people who uh, have not listened to the episodes with all of you. So I'll just uh, call your name out um, and go in the order that you are in the Zoom box. So Jeff, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, thanks. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff. I'm an engineer at Stripe. I work on stream processing systems. Right now, I lead change data capture at Stripe. And before Stripe, I worked at Netflix for a number of years, where I also worked on stream processing systems, worked on an open source project called Mantis, and also worked on other infrastructures such as Flink and Kafka. Awesome. Thanks so much. Pete. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Pete Goddard. I'm the CEO of Deep Haven Data Lab. Uh, my history is in the capital markets. So think of uh, Wall Street meets systems meets, you know, quantitative math and things like that. Uh, I run Deep Haven, which is a, an open source query engine that's built from the ground up to be very good with real time data on its own and in conjunction with historical or static stuff. Um, it's also a series of uh, APIs and integrations um, and experiences that create a framework because working with real time data is uh, is pretty young. So we want people to be productive with it. Nice to be here today. Thanks so much. All right, Arjun. Hi, everyone. I'm Arjun Narayan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Materialize. Materialize is a streaming database that allows you to build and deploy streaming applications and analytics with just standard SQL. <clears throat> Materialize is built on top of an open source stream processor called Timely Dataflow. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of a, a, I bring a SQL partisan uh, perspective to this uh, panel. Uh, before this, I was an engineer at uh, Cockroach Labs, uh, working on CockroachDB, which is a scalable, scale out SQL OLTP database. And before that, I did a PhD in distributed systems. Um, been in the distributed systems and database world for, for quite a while and uh, excited to be here. 
Awesome. Love, love that you're getting the bias out up front. It's great. It's equal partisan. <laughs> I, I think I, I think I, people needed the disclosure early on yeah. before I got uh, fiery. <laughs> Love it. All right, Ashley. I'm uh, Ashley Jeffs. Hi, everyone. I maintain the open source streaming ETL service. I think we'll call it today. Uh, Benthos, and uh, that includes writing code, pull requests, um, building emojis, and uh, mascots. And I've been doing that for about five years. And before that, my life had no meaning. <laughs> the emojis are the most important part of the project. <laughs> Pretty much. The That's when you is... know your project is a success. <laughs> That's exactly right. The swag is actually great. Well, Ashley, I actually want to, uh, you said uh, streaming ETL, um, which is a really interesting phrase. And so what I want to start off with is a discussion on how we should think about uh, batch versus streaming. Um, there's a lot of new streaming technology out there. Um, and, you know, people are working on all sorts of different data flows. And, you know, sort of the standard stack has a lot of batch and has maybe implemented uh, some sort of streaming capabilities. Um, but I'd love to hear from each of you your perspective on like how to think about batch versus streaming sort of in this new world where we have a lot of streaming tools. And Jeff, I think I'd actually like to start with you because you've built a lot of these systems at large companies and you're sort of um, you know, a, pr a practitioner doing the work inside of, inside of a company. So what does that look like for you in the work that you're doing? Yeah, it, it's, it's come a long way, but it's still quite nascent, uh, it being stream processing. Uh, for me, I like to segment it into two parts. One is the developer experience, and then the other is the user experience. So in terms of developer experience, you know, people are sort of conforming around this SQL-like tooling. There's also declarative tooling as well, uh, the, the tooling to get you started on writing stream processing applications, and then deploying them out, maintaining, observing them, et cetera. Uh, so that's still got quite a ways to go. It's certainly a lot better than it has been in the past, uh, especially compared to Batch, given that that has had uh, more um, like community involvement in terms of like bringing that up in the open source and improving on the tooling. The second part is user experience. So from the user's perspective, they just want to access their data, um, whether it's from streaming or Batch worlds, whether they're doing streaming or Batch computations. The challenges are in that the semantics are, are a bit different. And so the, the output or the behaviors of, of stream app, streaming applications might not necessarily be intuitive to the end user. So for example, in streaming, things are in more like a real-time fashion. So windowing comes into play where it's batch, the windows are much larger. Uh, that plays into the, the last part of my thinking, which is I think about it in terms of use cases. So uh, specifically with SLOs as the requirements for these use cases, uh, SLOs being freshness, correctness, coverage, and throughput. And then so as an example at Stripe, uh, I work in the, the finance, the payment space. So correctness is, is pretty important. Uh, freshness, less so originally, um, but it became more important because expectations only go up. So originally Stripe had a lot of systems in batch, but we were recomputing the world every day or every so often, and it just got very expensive. So then you try to go the angle of reducing the cost for that use case. After the cost is, oh, okay, well, we want things quicker. Expectations only go up, so we want more freshness. Oh, but the freshness is there, but now we want <laughs> things to be correct. And then so now we're, we're doing that. At Netflix is a bit different. Uh, I worked on uh, a system called Mantis, where uh, we were basically trying to make sure that uh, the systems, the streaming systems could stay up when you hit play that it works and it works well, the bit rate is there as it should be. Um, and so Mantis uh, took a different angle uh, where it, it used the user experience for the, for an, used an SQL like user experience, but made a certain set of trade-offs that we can go into another time or later uh, to make sure that we can compute all of these streams in a very cost-effective manner without losing uh, the ability to get gather insights and Arjun knows exactly what I'm talking about here with materialize. Uh, so that's it. So developer experience, user experience, use cases, uh, by use cases, 
led by SLOs, which is throughput, correctness, freshness, and coverage. Yeah, I love it. And, and There's I, a lot the, to talk um, about. Yeah, totally. I, well, I love the perspective of um, the user demand, right? And sort of streaming being driven by user demand for uh, data that you know is more real time, um, which is interesting, right? And that's sort of a, a self fulfilling cycle where you get data faster and then you want it faster and then you want it faster, which is interesting. Ashley, let's, let's jump to you. Do you want to explain what you mean by streaming ETL? And I think for a lot of people, those are two separate terms, right? As they just think about their practical day-to-day -day work, right? Well, ETL handles, you know, we have ETL jobs that run our batch stuff and then we have streaming stuff, but you put the two terms together. Can you dig into why you did that and, and what that means? Uh, no. Does that <laughs> disqualifies me from running the project? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, when when I so my introduction to data engineering was streaming because we had data volumes that were too big to run as 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 a batch. We were basically selling that data on, and it needed to be dealt with continuously. So to to do that um, at the levels that we had in order to execute that as some batch job. Um, we would need a stupid amount of machines to be running it. Um, so it was kind of like a defensive move, which I think is why some people early on resorted to streaming. Um, and it was about that time that Kafka sort of arrived and um, we started seeing that in, in the wild. Um, but the, the, main, the main takeaway, so you imagine like an ETL job as a batch is a process that... I would describe as you can have humans in the loop. So it's it's something that runs at some cadence and has a execution time that means it's realistic to have a human watching it happen and maybe even able to intervene. And it's it's therefore something that the tooling doesn't necessarily need to be that reliable. It doesn't need to be as um, self-fixing, self-correcting, um, Whereas when you're in a space where the data is continuously moving and it's it's moving at a volume that you can't deal with in a batch context anymore, you don't have the resources for, for dealing with a, a backlog that's you know so large, like a day's worth of data now is, is a massive cost to the business to, to process um, offline. Uh, now you're in a position where you can't always have a human watching it happen. And if something does occur that is an issue, they're not they're not going to be able to deal with it in a way that doesn't cost the business a huge amount of money. So the requirement for the tooling to deal with that problem is now um, it's much more important that it's able to keep that process running for as long as possible with as little intervention as possible. And when things do go wrong, it needs to be self-fixing to an extent where it's not going to take you a silly amount of time. And I think what what's kind of happened over time is that there, there were people like in, in my position who had to do streaming and they basically had to reinvent all these ETL tools because that's all we were doing. We were just taking data, trans, transforming it, enrichments, that kind of thing, filtering, uh, maybe a bit of mapping, that kind of stuff. And then we're just writing it somewhere else. So that that is an ETL job, which traditionally you wouldn't have so much data that you can just do that once a day and it would run for an hour or that kind of thing. Uh, but then we were in a position where that wouldn't work. So we had to reinvent all these tools. Um, and Essentially, in the process of doing that, which I would imagine all my colleagues here are um, familiar with, is this idea that you have to make your tool that much better at dealing with various edge cases and problems because you can't expect a human to be able to just come in and fix everything for you. Um, and I think one of one of the repercussions of that is because the tools are becoming so much more autonomous and able to deal with all those problems, people who have batch workloads, they don't necessarily need to do things in a streaming way they can now look at these tools and go, oh, that looks a lot easier. That actually looks like I have to do less stuff in order to, to have that uh, do my, mm. my workload. So um, I kind of call it a streaming ETL because I, I see a lot of people using Benthos who they have a batch workload, right? They don't have a volume of data that requires continuous real-time flow. Um, they'd be quite happy with just you know a, an hour-long job run daily or even weekly um, and they're choosing to use Benthos just because they know that they can just leave it running. And if there's a problem, it'll fix itself. Like it's not it's not going to require some sort of intervention and they don't need to think, oh, have we checked that it executed today um, and check the status of that. They just know that they'll get alerts if something's gone wrong 
And if something has gone wrong, they probably just need to restart it or add more nodes, that kind of thing. So I kind of feel like it's it. I call it that because I I don't want to I don't want people to look at a streaming project and think oh well that's not for me because I don't have real time payloads. Um, mm. I don't have requirements that that would necessitate something that complicated. Because really, at the end of the day, it ends up becoming operationally simpler in a lot of ways than than some sort of large batch um, workflow tool. Super, super helpful perspective. Okay, Arjun, I want to jump to you and I'm going to add a modification to the question. So with that context where you don't necessarily have to have a streaming service running something um, because the basic parameters are sort of SLAs around batch or fine, but it simplifies a lot of things. Would love for you to speak to that, but also with the added question of like, do you think there's a future where batch kind of goes away because of those dynamics, right? The tooling gets way better and um, it's actually just easier to have continuous streams. So I think it's it's worth um, thinking about the use case carefully in that there's a big difference between human in the loop versus no human in the loop. So when there's a human in the loop, um, the, there is a much higher latency that we can tolerate because there's only so much, so, there's only so frequently that a human's going to like look at a dashboard or or react to a to a new data point, right? And you know, humans go home, they sleep. You can run the batch job then. Then uh, there's a big difference in a phase shift that comes about when you start doing things in an automated fashion, where powering automated actions off of batch workloads uh, starts to immediately feel too slow because you have the data, you know what the data point is, you, you've collected the events, say a customer is on your website, they've done an action, and then it's going to take you something like 10 hours for the ETL to crank through, for the batch workload to finish, and then for you to take some action. Um, that immediately feels like an unacceptable amount of latency, and that's oftentimes the big differentiator between streaming and batch. It's when you're doing these automated actions, and most companies get introduced to this workflow because they start to do email marketing, right? So they, they, they have some data, they have some actions, they segment their users, they decide they want to do some email marketing, and that's actually fine in batch, but uh, you quickly realize the difference between taking action when somebody is on your website versus you know, the next day. Uh, I'm sure we've all had that experience where like, you know, you were searching for a mattress, you go online, you spend about two hours, there's a two hour window, we're trying to find the perfect mattress. And then you find the perfect mattress, you hit checkout. The next day you come back on the internet, it's just like mattresses, mattresses, mattresses. It's like, it's too late, right? Like it's cause all those batch jobs just finished overnight. And then they've decided you're in the market for mattresses. And your perspective yeah. is like, I was, and I'm not buying another mattress for another decade. Please go away. And then eventually, you know, they realize that the moment of has, has moved on. And and it's these automated actions, these sort of personalization, these this segmenting the customer, these things where streaming really delivers um, outsized returns uh, because there is no human in the loop. Yeah. So I love what you said there, Arjun, and I think it really speaks to my perspective on streaming. So uh, Deep Haven was founded. Uh, because we thought we saw the future, uh, you know, our, our team comes from the capital markets and unlike uh, most of the people that are in this space, frankly, people in the capital markets know uh, it is not a batch world and now they're streaming. We know that the opposite is true. We know that uh, for ever since the capital markets went electronic, which is the late 90s in, in Western Europe and, and in the US, that actually you make all of your money in streaming. There is no such thing as trading an hour ago. There's no such thing as I want to buy a stock yesterday. I cannot do it. I can only react to things right now. So all of Wall Street has been automated for a few, couple of decades around real-time data first. And it's done that with, his, of course you need context, of course you need history, of course you need state, but that real-time streaming technology has been married to historical static uh, batch data sets as well. I think the change in the last uh, 10 years, and certainly the change that Deep Haven is trying to be a part of, is uh, how do you move that from being bespoke code that is written by very, very sophisticated developers, and frankly, uh, the, the elite players in the, in the 
tech groups uh, across Wall Street. How do you migrate it from being those custom solutions to instead being general purpose streaming technologies? And I think uh, you know many of the technologies that you guys are mentioning here are relevant. There's the um, you know there's the transport buses that obviously have become quite popular with uh, you know Kafka compatible stuff and the you know Zero and RabbitMQ and Solace and uh, Chronicle queues and all of these types of things. All you're doing is you're really taking what we've been doing on Wall Street for a long time with our custom solutions and we're making it open source, general form, et cetera. And we think that this is the future for many other industries, that that will be what all of you are saying is, you know, what we agree with. And that is, uh, you know, your real time data is the most valuable stuff, whether real time to you means a millisecond, real time to you means 10 minutes, I don't care. Let's call that real time. And, uh, uh, you know, what Jeff said about um, that data being available to a user, the same as any historical data, um, is entirely relevant. And so what we think is important is that the same methods need to be work on streaming as on uh, and dynamic data as it does on batch and static data and that good technologies will make it so that the user doesn't have to really care they can just use the same stuff and it will work on both it will all merge it can all join um, and you can just get to work on data and stop thinking about streaming versus batch and that's the way deep haven organizes itself so I love, uh, Pete, uh, if I may jump in, um, I love the background that, that you just gave us because you're absolutely right that Wall Street has been doing streaming before anybody else has been doing streaming. I mean, if you look back, you know, before Kafka and RabbitMQ, there was TIBCO, and then before, you know, any of these stream processing frameworks, there was KDB Plus, and, and these were sort of the pioneering ways in which to express computation, move data around. Uh, but it also, and the flip side of it is it required this extremely specialized skill sets, right? Like you have all these banks where there was these, you know, three KDB programmers and they were, you know, writing this almost hieroglyphic programming uh, that nobody can understand and, and everything sort of runs through them. Um, and what I love about Deep Haven is it's really bringing the best of, you know, the modernized data science, Python, R communities, the, the communities that, that have not had access to streaming. They, they have been living in a pure batch world and, and uh, bringing the best of both worlds together. And I obviously bring a very different uh, sort of set of backgrounds to streaming. I mean, I've, I've, I've never, never been on Wall Street, never, never worked, but I have the greatest respect because uh, those guys really were first to, to uh, implementing these technologies and pushing them to production. And, and, and whenever we do interact with them, um, you know, they, they bring a wealth of expertise and experience and, 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 and speak in, in much more technical precision than, than uh, you know, I think, I think in Silicon Valley, uh, including sort of the deep theoretical understanding of like the bitemporal, multi-temporal queries and, and how, how one can express those computations. Yeah, well, it's, it, it, it's, it's sweet of you to say. I think the, um, you know, the, the, the real, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not a hist you know, I'm, I'm not well versed on the history of how all this has come to be in the last few decades. So the, the, the battle between streaming and batch is somewhat lost on me. It seems like, uh, it seems like semantics to a certain extent, uh, because when we think about architecture, you know, we think of print, you know, first principles of architecture, fundamentally, we just think that, uh, data changes and your architecture should expect data to change. I know that you are very much embrace similar there where, um, you know, rather than pictures of data that then you need to compute um, on a whole new batch set that has come in to have your architecture organized in such a way that, hey, you know, new stuff is going to come in. You want to be able to react to it um, to serve your use cases you know, that, that's the architecture you should put in place. If that means you want to use the word stream for that, fantastic. Um, but you could, you could use whatever terminology you want. Just fundamentally, uh, we think you should embrace that the, the first principle that your data is going to change and you should be organized accordingly. So guys, uh, I think that's like a great opportunity to have like a, a little bit of like history lesson, let's say. So it would be great like to hear from you of like how you have experienced, let's say, the evolution of like the streaming processing uh, platforms. Um, 
I remember, uh, for example, I mean, beginning of like the previous decades, uh, we had like Spark streaming uh, at some point. Then we had Twitter coming out like with Storm, Samza. Like there was like some kind of explosion in like uh, seeing at least open source projects around like streaming processing. New architectures coming out there, like the Lambda architecture, for example, where like people were trying to uh, put like um, bots together with streaming. Then we had Kafka with um, Kafka architecture. I think they like trying to merge everything into like a streaming platform and like give like also some primitives that are like more native to to bots. Um, and obviously, like there's a lot of value delivered through all that stuff. Obviously, some technology survived, some are not are obsolete today, but we have like companies like Confluence going public uh, and people making money, obviously, out of all that stuff, which is always good. So what happened this like past decade, let's say, and also like, what do you feel like it's next because all of you like one way or another like you are working on like building the next iteration of streaming uh platforms so it would be great like to have this connection uh and let's start with uh arjun like would you like to uh absolutely thank you uh yeah i i think i think what pete articulated as a is 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 the destination or the place we all want to get to where you know batch and streaming are really sort of implementation details, I completely agree with that 100%. I think we're about 10% of the way there, right? And it's been, mm -hmm. been multi-decade uh, journey. And some of the some of the projects you brought up, uh, I think Storm was sort of the the earliest open source project. And, and the way I would articulate it is the things you could do in streaming were a tiny, 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 tiny subset of what you could do in batch back then, right? So uh, Precisely on the implementation level, you couldn't do any query pro or any stream processing that required that your stream processors maintain a lot of state, right? So you couldn't you couldn't effectively do lookups to historical data. You were sort of building these, um, and and in the algorithms world, this is sort of streaming algorithms are those algorithms precisely that you know don't maintain very much state, sort of in a big O sense. Um, and that was really what uh, was enabled by by Apache Storm, right? So you had this as a user, you had this big um, trade-off. You had, do I care about low latency and am I willing to limit what I do computation-wise? Or do I need that complex computation and I'm willing to give up low latency and do it in batch processing? So that was sort of the trade-off you had to navigate. In terms of a Venn diagram of, 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 of you know, the use cases were, you know, pretty, pretty separated. Like there was this giant circle, which is the things you can do in batch, and this tiny, tiny circle off to the side of what you can do in streaming. And over time, as, we ha as we've had more capable stream processors become you know, available, those that Venn diagrams have started to have a little bit of overlap, right? And that, that is where I would say is the Kappa architectures that, you know, um, I think, I think uh, the Kafka folks uh, articulated. Before that, we even had the Lambda architecture. So, 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 so zooming even further back, um, people people didn't want to make this trade off, right? They were like, I care about low latency, but I also want the fancy computation. So maybe what I can do is sort of by getting the best, I'll, I'll run a batch computation side by side with the streaming computation. I'll do the fancy stuff in batch, and I'll do some sort of approximation of the computation that I want in streaming, and I'll keep periodically running the batch computation because I'm going to diverge from 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 the, the true computation that I want because the streaming is an approximation. Um, and then I'll sort of revert back to the batch and then reset and then recontinue. And this will get, and this was hideously complex, right? Now you're running like three different systems. You've got the batch, the streaming, and then the little thing, putting it all together. Um, and, and the Kappa, Kappa architecture was the simplification saying, why don't you just run everything through the stream processor? The problem with this, as Ashley has uh, brought up, is the developer experience is terrible. Right? Like everything in streaming is manual and writing lots of code and maintaining tons of infrastructure. Um, whereas in batch, the lived experience that people have in batch is like, da, 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 I just write a little SQL or I write a little, um, you know, in the, in the data science world, I write this little Python program and I get to harness the power of a scale out, horizontally scalable, reliable, massively parallel cloud architecture that 
works on terabytes and terabytes of data for me. It, you don't have any of that in streaming, right? So streaming today, it's like, well, that's great. Now you're on the hook for your schema changes. You're on the hook for, you know, errors in your data stream. You're on the hook for expressing the the implementation. So the nice thing about SQL, or and it's not just SQL, there's other sort of um, languages for sure in which you can express computation um, declaratively. But in streaming, you haven't had that luxury. You've had to build out your own implementation languages. And I think over time, and certainly our goal at Materialize is to make for the subset of batch computation, which you think is a pretty large subset um, of SQL, to make that available to people in streaming so that they can be streaming with just SQL. This does not cover all of the use cases, right? So just as you have Snowflake and Databricks, right? Like there, there's, there's, there's a whole world out there that's not SQL yeah. um, for, for, for data science and uh, machine learning. And absolutely, we'll need solutions in that side of the space as well. But I think, you know, we're maybe 10, maybe 20% of the way there, um, mm -hmm. such that, you know, we're getting to that promised land. The way I would, I would, I would, I would rephrase what Pete said, it's like, you know, we need to get to the point where streaming is 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 a superset of what you can do in batch right so that mm -hmm. eventually we think of batch as a subset of the capabilities that we can do in streaming does this mean the batch processors are going to go away no i think i think there'll absolutely be some times where um the same computation you can sort of choose do i want to use a batch runner because i have you know i have all that infrastructure already set up maybe it's a little bit cheaper um or do i want a streaming runner you should be able to move computation back and forth um between sort of underlying infrastructures uh, I don't think I don't think batch is going away entirely, but I want it to become I want the batch versus streaming debate, I think, decades from now to be this sort of as as much of an implementation detail as like, hey, are you running this on a columnar or a row oriented uh, execution mm -hmm. engine? It's like actually, you know, like 99 percent of people do not care what the answer to yeah. that question is. Right. They just experience it as like, oh, this is great. I'm having a really pleasant yeah. developer experience. Yeah, it makes total sense. So, okay, let's uh, ask, like, I'll, I'd like to ask you, so you said that you had, uh, I mean, you were working like in a company, you had like to work with a lot of data, you had like to deliver the data like in a real time fashion. Why didn't you use just, I don't know, like Flink and Kafka, right? Or whatever storm, like whatever was like available back then out there. And you decided to go and like build your own solution that's, uh, mm -hmm ended up like uh, becoming benthos it was because of the the types of work we wanted to do so i think one of my early frustrations with stream processing tools was that there was this focus on the, the really high fruit in the tree which was the um the actual queries you know i was interested in single message transforms mm -hmm. um which was we're taking data we're doing a small modification to it um, you can do that stuff with those tools, but we had latency requirements that it just didn't didn't work out. But the the other bit um, that was missing was being able to orchestrate a network of enrichments. So we had um, lots of different types of data science enrichment that we needed to add to these payloads as they were passing through our platform. And um, it was non-trivial, the mappings between them. So we needed one was requirement, the other. So we ended up with this DAG of um, directed acrylic graph um, of these enrichments that we needed to execute in a streaming context, which meant as, as quickly as possible with as much parallelism as possible. Um, and none of those tools, you could do it with those tools as a framework, uh, but we needed something that was going to execute those things um, and what we were looking for was declarative because we needed to slowly iterate on those enrichments, change where they were, how they operated, what kind of data they were giving us back and requiring um, because they were being actively worked on and slowly change the graph um, as, as new, new requirements came in. And the idea of having to compile a code base every time that happened was it, it just wasn't realistic. Um, so we wanted to offload some of that work to um, non-engineers, but it still be owned by engineers. Um, so we kind of went down this decorative path, um, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where the Benthos essentially started was was kind of iterating on those those key principles. But I mean, all of those all of those tasks are something that you could do with a batch um, system right now, and 
as we were getting these streaming tools that were kind of like an alternative to batch for the analytics part, we I, we just didn't have any any options for for the actual pipelining stuff. There's like logging tools because almost all engineers um, have logging as a as a streaming problem. It's basically a stream uh, mm -hmm. processor, but then you don't get the delivery guarantees um, and the observability and those kind of things uh, baked into it. So yeah, it just it it felt like for for me in my position that was the biggest gap. That's the that's the bit that I kind of I focused in in on was integrations with services, enrichments, um, transformations, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you see like the, uh, like Benthos uh, being, um, uh, how, how, how did the project like evolve, especially like from a perspective of, let's say the use cases, right? From when it started inside like the company up to today, right? Where um, you're like maintaining a project that is used by like so many like people outside the company that initially was, intended uh for like what's the what's your experience there like how did you see like things changing in terms of like uh taking a streaming processor for a very specific um use case that you had there um and being adopted i would assume like for different uh use cases too so can you oh uh, yeah mm -hmm. um so I, I we already had a bit of practice with making something like that generalized. So having like a configuration schema for expressing enrichments as integrations to arbitrary things. So the idea of you know you have a you have language that can communicate interacting with an HTTP service or a Lambda function or a database query or you know this and that and this. Um, so I'd kind of dabbled with it. I could see where the the problems were in, in generalizing that stuff. So I kind of just, you end up just biting a bigger chunk of um, how, how much you're going to abstract over that stuff and it still be user-friendly. Um, once I'd, once I'd gotten that, you reach that nice uh, Goldilocks position of being super easy for people to pick up quickly and run with. But also when somebody comes to you and says, hey, I have this thing that it can't do yet. Can you make it do that? You can really quickly add that in. Um, so you're not immobilized by it's so generic and it's so generalized that you can't you can't make things easy for people. But then it's not so easy and intuitive for its existing use cases that you can't slot something else in. Um, that's mostly just the config. It's, it's basically the way that I've kind of decided to chop the concept of batching and what a message is, what a batch is inside the process itself, and what the responsibilities of the various component types, like what, what is a what is a process, what is a transform, um, what is a what is an output, um, how do you compose those things? Um, but the, the 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 core concepts haven't really changed that much since day one, and that's because I'd already had practice with a few um, attempts at, at generalizing that kind of thing. Um, and then after that point, it literally just becomes a case of five years of people going, oh, but what if it could just do this extra bit as well? And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's put that in All and right. never saying no. That's, 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 that's cool. So, okay, Jeff, your experience are like, uh, in, uh, Netflix again, like, all these tools out there, right? Why you ended up like building commandies? Like, what was the reason that? made you like say, okay, we need something new. Uh, like whatever tools are out there, like they do not fill the gaps that we have here. Yeah, so, so Mantis fundamentally is a stream processor, but the use case that started it all was um, basically trying to reduce uh, downtime or MTTD or M like mean time to insight and understanding why something's happening. Um, like something negative is happening to the service. And so you have your traditional uh, telemetry stacks like metrics, log, logs, and traces. And so certainly we, at Netflix at the time, we did use that, but after some point, it just got too expensive uh, to like shove all, if we wanted like the, the most granular insight possible, we would have to log everything all the time, aggregate it, store it, hopefully TTL it out the other end later. Um, but we needed something that could get us the cost, cost effectiveness while upholding the, like the granular insights. And so uh, to give an example, like petabytes of data were going through the system and then most people would filter out like 99.9% .9 of it. And then, so one of the 
one of the great use cases is like, I'll, oh, I'll give you, I'll give you all an example. So, uh, Mantis gives you the ability to say, if I'm looking at, if there's a playback issue, like someone's having problem playing a title, we can get that insight into which country they're coming from, which title, which episode, which device, and then uh, like versions of the device. And then you can exactly see like what's going on. And so that's very, very targeted query to like a specific thing. And so you don't really pay, you don't pay the cost of, of um, that query if it's not in use basically. So it's more of like a reactive model, like the reactive streams model. And so uh, another example is like when, when we were decommissioning a Netflix app for some devices, we could see exactly which users are using that over time. And then maybe send them an email say like, hey, we're gonna decommission this app for this device, please go do something else. Um, and so, it was more of like a real-time use case, like, like what's happening here and now. Uh, another example is when we, when we do like regional failovers, uh, which happens quite regularly, like you can see the number of people hitting play, like dip in one region and increase in another region. And then when we fail back, it goes the other way. And so it's used for a lot of tooling. But then the other feedback we've gotten was like, okay, well, what if I don't want real time? What if I want to look at something like in a batch case or in like a snapshot of data? or join that uh, like historical context with the streaming set of data to make some sort of decision later on. So then our answer to that was, okay, we would just build in syncs. So sync it out somewhere else. And then you would have to do uh, like basically a stream table join later on, but that's another story. So it, it all started with observability basically. Hey, Jeff, can you by chance, um, one, I've heard you speak before, and one of the things that you say that I think is really interesting mm. and, and very important actually for the stream community is this idea of uh, not sharing all of the data. I think that that's one of the founding principles mm. of Bantis. And I think for stream processing uh, players that are used to just receiving a fire hose queue and then having to do things about it, you're approaching that a little bit differently. And I think that's an important concept because you can all of a sudden be moving a lot less data around your around your system or your mesh which is a, a principle also that uh i think arjun uh uh holds dear so can you talk to us about how that came about as a principle and how you've executed that in your system yeah the, there's three parts so so first is we encourage developers to to publish all of the data that they can so so like an event might have hundreds of fields uh and it might be like uh, very large in size, basically. Um, but we also have it so that the infrastructure doesn't consume all of that data by default. Like you have the ability to do that, you being the uh, user, but you have to be very intentional in doing so. So certainly there are some long running jobs which basically perform a select star, 100% sample, uh, but it has to be, maybe it's a low volume stream or, or something like that. But most people would either do like a sample or select some of the fields or even filter some events out based off of a condition. Uh, so the first, so first is like publish everything, but be very intentional about what you consume. And then the second is um, like reusing uh, like subscriptions basically. So if multiple people are asking for the same set of data, and uh, if you have that buffered in memory, like just don't go all the way up to the source of the data, like these applications, just send what you have down to the people that are subscribed. To, to that same, um, with the same pattern of, of, of data that they're asking for. And so really you're getting like a lot of reuse, you're getting a lot of um, like intentionality, like consume only what you need. And because in reality, you don't want all of the data. Uh, and if you do, then you can do that if you want. Yeah, we, uh, we hold the same things dear. We, we use the phrase, uh, you know, we move data around the system in lazy fashion, right? Mm -hmm. That the, the producer, uh, our APIs uh, allow the producer to have quite a bit of information from the consumer in terms of what it what it wants from the table and at what update frequency it wants, because there's different use cases. Some of them are throughput, some of them are latency, and some of them are consistency driven. Um, and then we also sort of hold on to what you just you talked about in regards to sharing work product, you know, we memoize data so that, you know, if you have a, a few consumers that want the same thing, you're, you're able to, because oftentimes, you know, you could think at scale out, it might be a few thousand consumers. Um, and so there's a lot of 
<clears throat> there's a lot of less work that needs to be done in these um, you know, these are the types of use cases that are really evolving quickly in the streaming world, we think. Uh, so guys, one of the, like, the, um, so the things that um, surfaced like through the conversations that we have is that uh, like something that's like quite important around like streaming uh, processing is like the developer experience. It's like something that like still needs like a lot of work uh, and probably is one of the things that I mean, like the, the, the previous wave of um, technology out there, like didn't pay as much attention as like they, they should. And my question is like, and I'll start um, a bit with you because you are like offering like a product that exposes like an interface to the users that's like very, let's say um, familiar, like to a very specific uh, group of people that are not, necessarily extremely technical right like in the sense of like the engineering of these systems so i want to ask like how we can take like streaming and make it at the end like more accessible to engineers out there and like developers who don't necessarily know like uh, or have to know like primitives that like delivery semantics um like um all these things that you have to understand in order like you talk about like producers and consumers like and all these things like when you're interacting with the database you don't think in these terms right like and like it, a database is like what most engineers like and developers have been exposed to so how we can bridge let's say all these primitives um that and the new language that like streaming is bringing on the table uh with what is like most commonly known out there to developers um, and it's one of the questions that we got also like from uh, one of like the attendees uh, that okay like you can uh, let's say for example exchange like the terms extract to publish load to consume but at the end like is this what is needed like do we need to change our language um, and like educate people or we can do better uh, so so I have a, I have a bit of a radical answer to that. Um, it's a little bit self-serving, so I, I hope you'll pardon my indulgence here. But um, uh, we actually we actually introduce a new primitive that we think is important. So we think event streams and, and message queues are vital, and and we understand that that is the, the the foundational building block of the conversation we're having today. We could not embrace it more heavily. However, we don't think it's the whole story. We think that the most intuitive object for uh, people to work with for data-driven applications, uh, for data uh, science, for data analysis is the table, the data frame, right? I'm not making this up. This, is Pete, this isn't this is Pete Goddard's opinion. Uh, walk around, see how many people use Excel. Go you know, survey SQL, look at our data frames, look at Python pandas. It's not an accident. They're all tables or something darn close to a table. So uh, what we've done at Deephaven, and, and we put it out in open source, um, is uh, we've really tried to create uh, a dynamic table. So tables should not be static. They should be things that can change, right? Um, that should be true at the API level. That should be true at the engine level. And that should be true at the user experience level and the APIs, the JavaScript APIs that are supporting that. So we think that that is a very important proposal to the world or to the community in regards to how do I make it easier to work with streams. So uh, when you're using Deephaven, you might uh, integrate with, uh, you know, whatever, you'll copy paste something we have from our documentation to onboard a Kafka stream or uh, a Red Panda stream, or, um, you know, you'll integrate Solace or something like that, right? And now you, or, or our enterprise customers will, you know, push a, a binary log from Java or C++ applications of theirs, right? But once it hits, when it hits Deephaven, it, it really is a, it hits as a table structure. And, um, and then we keep track of changes in the table. And I think making it so that we can do really high performance compute, because we're only uh, doing calculations on changes instead of on the actual data, which means less data and faster compute um, is a, is powerful, but it really works because we let people think in terms of tables and we let people use tables and, oh, you want to do machine learning? Well, chances are you're using tensors, which are arrays, which are, you know, chunks or columns of tables. This construct of pushing 
a table around, a dynamic table around as a first primitive is really, really helpful for the user experiences you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in addition to one of the things that this group is well aware of, as soon as you get out of the bat, like think of how much money, meaning market cap is involved in batch world, right? So just, just think of BI, right? BI, you have uh, 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 Tableau and uh, Looker and, you know, Power BI and Click and, you know, 12 other competitors, right? Yeah. So get, give any of them a stream and like, you know, your experience is pretty much gonzo. Um, yeah. So, so there needs to be significant investment to support those types of, you know, development, exploratory, interactive, and, uh, you know, dashboarding experiences with real time data. Um, we've been very involved with that for a number of years, but we obviously will bring it, it will need a, a community to, to get it all the way there. Yeah. So, Jeff, uh, you mentioned like for Mondays uh, specifically that you like implemented more of like a reactive model there, right? Which reactive programming is like a paradigm that is, I guess, like quite well known in people that are doing like even like front end development, right? So what's what's your opinion on like how we can make like streaming technologies more approachable to more engineers out there? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, in, in my mind, what's going on in my, in my head, there, there's like the user and then there's the developer. Yeah. Uh, user is one story, but what I've been thinking about a lot lately is I've actually written a stream processor very early on in, in my, in my like, computering career. Uh, it, it looks like take a list, call stream, call flat map, call reduce, right? So that's like an API that's very standard in a lot of programming languages. Or, or, or take another example, you have a list and then you use, you have a for loop uh, and then you go through and then mm -hmm. you do something with it. And so like kind of like the reactive streams, like you have like, like API that has, uh, you know, your flat maps and all that other stuff. Like I'm wondering from a developer perspective, perspective that's kind of just what I want to do. I know how to write a for loop. I know how to write a stream, flat map, reduce, et cetera. And if I could just give that to somebody and then they'll parallelize it, they'll manage all the state, throw in the rocks DB and all that other stuff. Like that's good for me. Cause I, I know, I know what a list is and I know what a for loop is and, and, and that works for me. Uh, another example is like in some of these stream processors, there are great APIs to do like windowing and, and triggers and all sorts of stuff. Um, but if you want the ultimate flexibility, there's things like just the process function. Uh, or, or just basically uh, a block of code that you write, you run, you put all sorts of variables in there. Um, and that's pretty nice. Like that's, that's kind of just what I want as a developer. Yeah, makes sense. Ashley, what about you? Like you have built um, a tool uh, from scratch. So, and you are like interacting a lot with like developers out there. So what is missing? Like, what do you think that's missing like from streaming up uh, infrastructure to become like more approachable no i think the first thing that if if you take a developer that's innocent and hasn't suffered at the hands of stream processing and you invite them into your world of like, hey why don't you do that with streams um i think the immediate repulsion to that is oh it looks like a lot of hassle um that looks like it's going to wake me up at night and i'm going to have to do all kinds of stuff to get that back up and i think um answering that in that anxiety is i think for for me that's been one of the it's i wouldn't say it's a struggle it's more when people get to me they've already overcome that somehow um so i'm kind of like seeing this relieved oh actually this isn't that, this isn't that bad um but i think the the operational side is still a nightmare and it's still, there's a lot of moving parts still. There's all the different services. You imagine like an architecture of stream processing, um, a team that's decided that they're going to lean into it heavily and everything's going to be on the you know low latency side. The number of moving parts is vast if you want everything. And every component wants its own state. It wants its own claim to the disk. It wants its own um, thing that can fail. And the idea of being woken up at 3 a.m. and one of your disks is corrupt. And you've got to sort out, okay, well, which services in my streaming platform now, you know, have been suffering? How have they been suffering? How do I recover them from that state? 
um, it's it's overwhelming, I think, for a lot of people. And it's very comfortable to just say, okay, well, we don't need that yet. We don't we don't need that kind of thing. Um, I think it's kind of similar to to you know Kubernetes and things like that, where it's 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 exciting to some people, but to to a lot of people, it's just it's too much hassle. Feels like it's um, it's not worth the investment. And I think it's it's something that is improving over time. There's obviously alternatives to Kafka now. There's um, companies like Red Panda. Lots of tools are coming along that try to you know simplify. A lot of the products here are nice and simple to use. Um, and just kind of slot into existing systems, which is great. Um, so I think that's kind of what I'm hopeful for in the future is that a lot of those moving parts become less moving actually, and more you, simple. Actually, do you feel like, I mean, isn't the data itself and the use case itself driving this? Like it's, I'm just unfamiliar, right? I'm not, I don't come from the same background as you. So I'm just unfamiliar of, oh, this is a thing that's working in batch. Should we try it in streaming? That doesn't there isn't much resonance with me, but um, hey, there's a new type of data. It drives a new type of value to me. Uh, I need to keep up with my comp competition. I need to be responsive in a shorter amount of time, or there are new data sets that are coming in where transactionality might not be as important. Therefore, I can embrace a new way of doing it. To me, this, from the people you talk to, is that oftentimes driving the migration to dynamic data, real-time data, streaming technologies, or is it really just, oh, it, you know, what you cited at first, which was they wanted to, do, you wanted to do batch, but you need to do it at such scale that you kind of had to do it all the time. Um, or, or, or what really drives people into this dynamic data stuff? It's, um, it's a bit of both. So there's, there's some people who have to, and they used to have something that they wrote themselves and it's dodgy and they wanted something that's not, um, and then there's, there's a lot of people who are just that, you know, they're using Benthos, which is a string processor to basically just read, um, it, a, a batch workload. Cause you can read like SFTP files. Um, mm -hmm. and they just, they like the fact that they can just run this thing and it's always on. It's always, you know, they, they only need this data like once a day to, to be refreshed. Um, but you know, they just like the fact that this thing will just always run. It just sorts itself out and seemingly, doesn't require much effort. Um, it's got a nice little config that, you know, three people can be working on in a um, source control. And you know, to them, it's, it's, it's a simpler world. And, you know, the, the job isn't that complicated. It's just, you know, hitting some endpoints and maybe has a fallback uh, with, with some dead letter queue or something on an alert. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's those two extremes and then there's everything in between as well. There's people who feel like we probably ought to make this, more efficient or, you know, streamy. Um, but we don't have to yet um, until we find the thing that, you know, suits our particular requirements. Um, it's kind of hard to say, but yeah, I, I see all of them. I see people from all walks of life coming and discovering, actually, it's not that bad. It's, it's the most, it, that's the main take is actually, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, okay, well, we are right at time here, but I want to get in this question uh, really quickly, and we'll see uh, we'll see how many of you can answer. Arjun, we'll start with you. Chris um, asked a great question. He said, "Coming from the traditional batch ETL world, I found using new vocabulary to describe things can help with thinking about how to do things in new ways. Examples: extract uh, versus publish, or load versus consume." Has there been any terminology that you use or have heard that you think has been helpful in terms of breaking out of the way that we talk about these things traditionally? I love this question. I'm going to take the completely contrarian point of view, um, which is that no, like we should stop doing this. Um, there's so much amazing vocabulary and intuition in batch. I mean, it's the entire, it's the entire um, reason we named the company Materialize, right? Which is which is what are you doing? What are you trying to do with the vast majority of these streaming pipelines? You are trying to build a materialized view that stays up to date over changing data um, and relating the difficult newness of streaming to the concepts that people are familiar with from batch, I think has a has a has a, has a tremendous amount of value. I know this is this is a bit of a contrarian hot take. It isn't very much 
a reaction to how needlessly complicated streaming has been for so long um, and trying to simplify it and in, in, in the terms that are most relatable uh, to the audience. And we really see the audience as people, you know, the hundred X, the amount of developers who have not tried streaming, have never, you know, have never poked at it and are maybe even a little bit rightly so afraid of, 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 of poking that bear. So I'm going to take the contrary and take, maybe I should have been the last to speak, but I love uh, it. I love it. Uh, Jeff, what say you? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually plus one on that. Just, just keep it simple. Uh, so I, I sit in the change data capture space right now. Really, you're just capturing changes from databases, AKA extracting something from a database. Someone wants to transform that and someone wants to load that somewhere else. So uh, j just keep it simple, I, I think. Um, ultimately, it, for, for me, it's like, are we talking about the technology? Or are we talking about the use case? I think ETL as a use case, like, yeah, you're going to extract something, you're going to transform it, you're going to load it. Uh, as a technology, there are many things under the hood which have other mm. definitions. Yep, that's great. All right, Ashley, you invented a new term called streaming ETL earlier on the call. So what do you think? I did not invent that. I've seen, <laughs> I, I promise you, I've seen that somewhere else. And I thought, oh, maybe that fits. <laughs> Um, I I'm not. <laughs> I'm not good to ask about this stuff. I'm I'm really bad with all because I mean I I was I didn't think I was a data engineer for for ages. Like I kind of discovered data engineering um, way late. I, I had a data engineering tool and I didn't know what data engineering was. <laughs> uh, so I mean the, all this stuff I've had to kind of learn. What do they mean when they talk about ETL? Because uh, to me that was just processing like that you, every yeah. program is etl it's reading something doing something and then putting something out so i mean yeah I, I feel like all these terms are super vague and kind of un conveniently unspecific anyway so i just kind of adopted them for whatever i had going on yeah but you just wait till you hear elt <laughs> the, the marketers are trying to uh are trying to confuse us all right pete uh with the last word you know i think my answer is similar mostly i just don't feel qualified uh to to dictate la language and nomenclature to people certainly i come from uh a space where uh pub sub systems feel pretty natural that you're moving data from one server to another and there are publishers and subscribers that forms a data mesh. I am, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that's a sophisticated concept to, to embrace and might be an easy way uh, to think of things. Um, you know, we, as, as others have said, I think the, the best thing we can do as a group is make it so that uh, we can talk in English that uh, a sixth grader can understand, right? So I am moving data mm. here um uh, this thing wants this data it is going to do that with it etc and whatever uh, words you you choose to coalesce your team around uh, that'll work for us so um you know probably my uh, we do think this idea of a the only term i would introduce is the one that i mentioned earlier which is is an invention of ours which is this streaming table um which is Look, it's got the same uh, attributes as streams, plus a lot other uh, more use cases that you can handle handle semantically with that primitive. Um, but it's 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 a table that changes, and probably when I say, "Hey, it's a table that changes," to a sixth grader, they can generally understand probably what I mean, and that is exactly what it is. Yeah, love it. Love the love the push for simplicity across the board. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We're a little over time. So thank you to uh, the listeners uh, and to the panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your time and have learned so much. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers. Man, Costas, we get to talk to a lot of really smart people. Um, you know, I think my takeaway uh, was that through all of the different complexities that we talked through, right? So use case complexities, technology complexities, different opinions on that. Um, was that at the end of the day, when we asked them how to describe these things, you know, with the user question, everyone said, keep it really simple, right? And Ashley even said, you know, when I first, I didn't know what ETL meant, right? I just called it processing. <laughs> and I'm taking data from here and, and moving it over here. I was just processing data, right? Um, and I really appreciated that because I think it's good 
with all of the new technology uh, and sort of the new ways of thinking about things, I think it's really healthy for us to step back and say, you know, at the end of the day, we're moving data. Like it, the technology can do some really cool stuff, but the fundamentals are actually not that complicated. And I think the other sub point, I guess I'm doing it, I'm forcing a two for one here, is that um, Jeff made the point that the user, the end user who wants the data could care less. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I, those are just really, really good reminders for me. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, what I'm going to keep uh, from this conversation that we had is that uh, the experience matters a lot uh, when you are working with these tools. And there are like two levels of the experience. There one is the experience that the developer has, who's going like to build um, whatever on top of these technologies. And then there's also like the user experience, which is the consumer of the data that comes out of these systems, right? And both of them, like, yeah, like, they like if we want to move forward and uh, increase the adoption of these tools, we need to make sure that they don't have to learn new terminology. They don't need to learn. They don't have like to learn new ways of thinking and designing systems. And we need to keep things familiar and simple as much as we can. Yep. Well, another amazing live stream episode of the panel. We have more of these on the schedule, so be sure to keep your eye out. We'll let you know when they're coming, and we will catch you on the next one. 